are pretty on Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. This is a very late, it's 2.30 on Friday when I'm starting to film because I've been busy and I just have to tell you what I've been busy doing. Um, one of my students, a really cute Spanish guy, I taught him in Vancouver years ago and we've remained friends. When he was visiting Tokyo a few years ago, we had a lovely, we met for dinner a couple times and he's a very sweet young man. And... Uh, I've helped him with some business PowerPoint presentations a little bit. Uh, never thought once about asking him to pay me for it, but he was doing an end of year, I don't know if it's end of degree, I don't even, don't know the details, but it was a university paper and it was 50 pages long. And he said, Sean, could you please proofread this? I want to pay you. And I said, okay, well, how about $50? He said, $50? I want to pay you 300 euros. So I said, okay. So I've been doing that since yesterday and didn't finish until noon today and then was in sore need of a nap. So here I am, relatively fresh and with 300 euros burning a hole in my pocket. It's sitting there in my PayPal account, which means that I can spend it on any book site or Etsy, which reminds me I haven't shown you the t-shirt yet. But so <laughs> let me get to that. Any online vendor that uh, accepts PayPal, so... I was just starting to get caught up in all my book hauls. My uh, bookish t-shirt is uh, short, on, uh, short on slogans, but it's a lovely image. And here I am with the late Friday reads. I have one bale to tell you about. And that is, sadly, this 1913 novel out of the UK, Sleeping Waters by John Trevina, the pseudonym of Ernest G. Henham. And it started out really good and I was making very slow progress with it but still enjoying it I got about 40 percent of the way through it and the plot just devolved into I don't know what it just got so weird in a way that just it ceased to become literary fiction so I lost interest and the characters also kind of got wobbly it was only at that point that I read uh, any of the Goodreads reviews and all of them complained about the wonky plot and <laughs> the, the weird character work, so I stopped. This was brought back into print by Valancourt Press a few years ago, and I'm not sure why. I have finished three. I'm a bit torn about this one because it wasn't very good. This is the New History of the Métis Peoples of Canada. The Northwest is Our Mother by Jean Taye. Uh, the subtitle, The Story of Louis Riel's People, the Métis Nation. And I gave it three stars because it taught me a lot that I didn't know about Métis. I would be embarrassed to see all of the misinformation I've been spreading, um, all of which a certain booktuber whose channel name I never remember uh, hastens to correct me in the comments section, but I don't think I'll make those basic, stupid settler Canadian mistakes about what the Métis nation is. I get it now, or I get a lot more of it, so a lot of credit is due to this book. And what was in this book made me just incredibly fascinated by the Métis culture, which I didn't know anything about. The way Métis people, um, especially the the branch of the Métis tree, family tree, where um, the original peoples in intermarried with Scottish settlers, and how that led to some Métis fiddling, which is just out of this world. So much rich cultural information here that I would say is qu was quite delightfully presented. This was a buddy read with Heidi of My Reading Life, and we basically agreed on the strengths and weaknesses of this book. Jean Taye is not a writer, and so the, none of the writing was very good, but she shined in presenting certain strands of the Métis story. She herself is a... I believe a great-grandniece of Louis Riel, and she is a lawyer. So anything to do with the, the legal battles of the Métis Nation within Canada, um, she did a good job of telling, but oh my god, I, I, I'm not going to rant about this, but it was a huge, absolutely crushing disappointment how bad the historical events were narrated. She is not a historian, and she really had no business 
trying to tell the story because she just botched it. And I don't mean that I'm an expert. I'm not. But I couldn't understand her historical storytelling. And she makes a very convincing case. I had no cynicism whatsoever about her saying early on in the book that she would be relying on oral history, oral narrative, as one of the primary sources for a lot of this stuff that there isn't any other documentation of. I buy that. Totally. But she also makes a number of claims that, not that when I first read them they struck me as groundbreaking, um, controversial statements to make about the history, because I didn't know enough about the history, but because they weren't well explained, I would go to Google, and I know Google is not necessarily authoritative, but it was obvious to me that she was making historical claims about certain aspects of the key historical events to do with the Red River Settlement and the 1885 resistance that nobody else that is mentioned online has asserted and then those sections had no footnotes and I just think that's really bad. I still think she's probably right but why would she say something that apparently no other historian has said publicly or asserted and there be to be no footnotes. I can't believe that she, she made me understand Louis Riel even less than when I started reading the book and that's her relative. The Red River Settlement sections were terrible, the 1885 resistance ch chapters were terrible, and I just mean that they were so confusing. So I'm, I'm starting to rant. Please weigh what I didn't like with what I started out with, that there was quite a few things in here that I appreciated. The last thing was, it's full of hand-drawn maps. And this is like a nice hardcover book published by HarperCollins, and they couldn't pay somebody to do decent maps, because so much of it was about territory. And... I could hardly read the handwriting on the maps. And I just, they, the, the maps were just embarrassingly amateur. And it's just f full of them. And they were useless. So, yeah, all in all, quite a disappointment. I will be reading uh, a much more Métis history to get, to get what, I, what this book kind of muddled. I'm not quite ready to talk about this. I should probably save it till next week because... Well, I finished the last story this week. My buddy reader and I are going to read the 10-page introduction next week, but I thought I'm going to count it as being finished this week. But to be honest, I haven't really taken the time to think about what I'm going to say about it. And that is this mammoth anthology, The Golden Age of British Short Stories, 1890 to 1914, edited by Philip Hensher. I gave it four stars, but basically what I would say is... I think there was only about one or two stories in here that I absolutely loved. Quite a few that I liked, and quite a few that I didn't like at all. So maybe four stars is generous. I would say that this anthology made me realize that I prefer much more modern short stories. My uh, problem, my curse, or my strong suit when it comes to adjudicating short stories is that I cut my teeth, so to speak, on Alice Munro and Mavis Gallant, and nobody else come close, although William Trevor might might be pretty close. But those stories were written from the 1950, 1970s to the present, and they do a lot more interesting things with narrative structure and are much more modernist. Obviously, these none of these really were modernist. Um, there is a James Joyce story in here. But, yeah, I I didn't love this collection. This was a buddy read with Joe Smith. We had a great time. And I think if I had to pick my favorite story without spending a lot of time reviewing it, it would have been one of the very first one, the third one, W.S. Gilbert, the guy who wrote all those musicals, also wrote short stories. And his short story, An Elixir of Love, was just fantastic. I, went, I immediately went and bought it. A collection of his short fiction. And maybe the second one would be Arnold Bennett, The Death of Simon Fugue or Fuge, F-U-G-E. That was also really good. There were some other ones that were really good too, but those two probably, they have stuck with me as being my, my favorite. So, it's done.
end, just last night, I finished this collection of short fiction out of India, and this was a five-star read, No Presents Please, by Jayant Kaikini, translated from the Canada language by Tejaswana Niranjana. I love these stories. Almost, I would say, more than half of them were five stars. There was maybe one or th three star and a handful of four star. It was just an absolutely delightful collection of short stories. This was a buddy read with Jutsna of Jutsna's Bookscapades. We had a really good time. I just finished the last story, the title story, yesterday. I have not read the afterword by the translator, which I look forward to doing after it's, I've sat with it for a few days. These stories were all set in Mumbai, and all, almost all of them were about down and out, kind of downtrodden, marginalized people, most of them single, and many of them yearning to escape from Mumbai, but being unable to, and there was kind of a love-hate relationship in a lot of the stories uh, that the characters had for the city, or that they were running from love, yet there was also a joy, a joyfulness that I don't usually respond to in fiction because it's usually sentimental, but in most of these stories there was a couple that I thought were crossed that line into, sent into sentimentality, but most of these were just joyous. The characters were joyful, not in that Dickensian way, just wow. And a lot of them were about people in the movie industry, and I learned a lot about... I googled everything that I didn't know, and there was usually a handful of words, untranslated words or just unfamiliar words, on every page. And I googled every single one and had such a good time talking back and forth with Jatsna, and I did made a recipe from this book. The recipe wasn't in the book, but the food was. Kakini works in the film industry. He writes for Bollywood, and... There's a lot about movie stars and movies and movie theaters as well. It's, you can see, I think, ticket stubs maybe on the cover. I will read anything this man writes that gets translated, and I hope all of it does eventually. I love this. I recommend it exuberantly. And I also feel a little bit unprepared to talk about uh, having started Mount Olive, the third in the Alexandria Quartet by Lawrence Durrell, buddy read with Adam of Memento Mori. I've read 20 pages. And I've been so busy for the last couple days, I have no idea what I read. I probably need to go back and start on page one. We're checking in on the first hundred pages or so. Tomorrow! So I've got my reading cut out for me, but it started out delicious. Mount Olive is the character, obviously, of the title, but Lawrence Durrell has a intriguingly weird habit of putting the title on the book where the character doesn't play the main role in that book but had in the book before or the book next book so it'll be interesting to see how much mount olive the british diplomat who becomes lovers with another main character's married mother how much this novel is actually about him but it's starting out uh, as tantalizing as the other two had been so that's what I've started, only that one, and I am planning to start two. There might, I'm still reading a whole bunch of stuff in the background for some secret projects, but I am going to start two. So two of the books I finished were buddy reads that have, are in perpetuity. One of them was with Heidi of My Reading Life, and so the next one that we are immediately going to start is this book on ind indigeneity in Canada in a, from a Canadian perspective. Indigenous Rights by Chelsea Vowell, a guide to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit issues in Canada. Three cheers for Heidi, who is so interested in all this stuff that she's reading about these issues in the Canadian context, despite being an American, but that's what happens when you live on a border state like Maine. So, um, we actually... It, this is interesting. Before we started this, several months ago, we decided to read the chapter about Métis identity in this book first. So we read it, and it gave us such a good grounding to dive into this. And throughout many of the really awful chapters in that other book, we kept fondly remembering how clear the writing was in the chapter on Métis identity in this book. So we're really looking forward to uh, reading the entire book from start to finish over the next several weeks. And I'm slow getting started on my Invisible Cities reads, but here is the first one, and this one will probably take me till Christmas to read, if I continue to read 25 or so books at one time. 
This is for the e for Ethiopia, The Shadow King by Maza Mengiste. And it was nominated for some awards last year, I believe. Maybe the Women's Prize or the Booker or something. I don't know. It's set in Ethiopia in 1935. And I have read some non-fiction stuff about Ethiopia around the same time. So I'm really looking forward to trying this, which I've heard good things about. The last thing I want to say is I want to shout out a channel I, I discovered four or five days ago. And after I stumbled upon it, I then found out that Bob the Booker had shouted them out. Let me add my voice to that acclaim. And the channel name is Shelf Possessed, which we need to give out a, an award annually for the best new channel name, and Shelf Possessed is in the running. That's an amazing channel name. And the two guys, it's a young gay couple from somewhere in the States, Craig and David, and they are fabulous. I think my reading tastes align more often with David than with Craig, um, and the highest compliment I know how to pay these guys is that I would say 75% of the books they talk about are of no interest whatsoever to me and I am utterly fascinated by every video of theirs that I've watched and I don't fast forward to anything I just love watching the dynamic between them. there's a playfulness and they did a bookstore vlog and the production values are high and the love quotient is throbbing. I love this new channel, Shelf Possessed. Go check it out if you haven't already. And if you'd like more kinds of fiction than is permitted on my channel, <laughs> more than just uh, women's fiction of the 1930s and literary fiction, they read all the other stuff plus some of that. So go check them out. I love what I see happening there. And that is what I have to say.